<laughs> it's so good to see you all here. I see a lot of friends in the audience and very excited to be invited to do a keynote presentation. And I actually researched it. And the job of the keynote is to provide the tone and the inspiration for a conference. And so I was in the back listening to Aaron Huey and uh, Ian Good talk about and listening to these people that are so passionate and so committed to what they do is actually inspiring enough. So I think we're off to a good start. Um, that's actually me uh, diving underneath the big waves of Hawaii. And the thread of my story of 20 years of taking photographs has always taken me back to the water's edge somehow. And uh, it didn't start there. I actually was born and raised and educated in, in Mexico many, many years ago in the mountains in a very small little town. And I love it, you know, when photographers share the stories of their childhood and they grew up in this amazing place, you know, the Arctic or Yellowstone. I had a pretty boring childhood, you know, one of five children. My parents were typical Mexican middle-class people. My dad was an accountant. My mom was a psychologist. And she was a pretty smart lady. So while she was doing her PhD, myself and my four siblings, we were being raised by a nanny. And this woman was amazing. She was an Otomi Mexican Indian. And she reminded us that she was a descendant of the warrior caste of the mighty Aztec Empire. And I believe her because she packed a mean spanking. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure. But she was the first person that ever showed me that there was a different way of being and a different way of seeing. And she introduced me and my siblings to the magic of being creative and artistic and storytelling. And so she was my first introduction to what Wade Davis calls the ethnosphere. And I love how he defines it because he calls it that ethereal layer that surrounds our entire planet and it holds all our hopes and our dreams, our traditions, our culture, our language, our rituals, our spirituality. We're all part of it. So early on in my career, after I finished uh, my training as a scientist, I realized that science is a very rigid and linear process and it was not the best way, not the most adequate way of explaining, number one, what's happening to our planet, and number two, just how complex our own relationship with nature is. Because science, you know, it's a, an experiment, it's oftentimes very linear, and our lives are always shifting and boundless, and our story never has an end. And so I came up on photography and storytelling as a tool that really inspired me, and as a scientist, I'm motivated by the knowledge that what's happening to our planet, and we're just standing by watching, while we investigate the consequences later, is a recipe for disaster. So as an artist, I want to remind us in a very emotional, creative, artistic, beautiful way that our fate is tied to the fate of our planet. And so what I want to do tonight is share with you just a little bit of a journey of some of the work that I've done and some of the amazing people that I've spent time with and a few of the lessons that I've learned from them. So we're going to start on an assignment that I did this year with National Geographic. Um, they're doing a documentary called The Last Ice in Greenland, and they're exploring the last place where there's going to be Arctic in the summer between Canada and Greenland. And we got to spend maybe, I don't know, 15 days traveling with the Greenland Inuit hunters, the last great hunting tribes of the north, and traveling on dog sleds and camping on the sea ice. And it was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done, but it was also really beautiful. And the first day, you know, this Inuit hunter that was assigned to be my musher packed up our sled. You know, there's packages, you can imagine, duffel bags and pelicans and tents and food. And then he looked at me and he didn't speak any English and he said, sit. I thought, is he talking to me or to the dogs? You know? <laughs> but this is what happened next. And mind you, there's no handles, there's no seat belts. <laughs> you know? You're just holding on for dear life. But I have to say that a, a dog sled uh, is a great platform from which to see the Arctic. And I know what you're thinking, because we all love animals. It's pretty cruel to use a whip with these dogs. But I learned by spending time with these guys that obedience is paramount to the survival, not just of the, of the hunter, but of the dogs themselves. And um, one of the things that I really loved about this trip was just spending time with these dogs, because they're huskies, they're Greenlandic, Greenlandic huskies. And they're not pets, they're not cuddly, they don't want to be touched or, you know, fussed with. They're working animals. Uh, but I thought they were pretty amazing. And in this picture, you can see what happens when they're not obedient. 
So we had a team that had too many young animals and they got feisty and they started pulling in the wrong direction and they went through the ice. And it was so dramatic because you've seen these animals that are tethered to the sled that's loaded with gear and it's sinking and these poor animals are trying to stay afloat. And, you know, we're all kind of a little bit of shock, you know, trying to figure out how do you help them without falling through the ice yourself. So it took a lot of team effort and eventually we pulled them out of the ice. But what became clear to me is the ice in the Arctic is becoming really dangerous. And so while for us the idea of climate change and sustainability is just a trending hashtag, for these people it's a day-to-day -day reality and it's pretty serious. Um, it took me a couple of days to learn the names of some of these people because I don't know if you've ever seen Greenlandic. Every word is <laughs> 20, 30 characters and they're mostly consonants. So after a couple of days, I learned that this gentleman, his name is Alekatsiak Perry. And I know, he's beautiful to look at. <laughs> but it dawned on me <laughs> that, um, that he is the great-grandson of Robert Perry, the great American explorer that claimed to have reached the North Pole in 1909. And Alekatsiak is really cool because not only is he a traditional Inuit hunter, he's also the lead guitar player in a rock band in his little village of <laughs> Kanak, population a thousand. And he's a pretty cool dude, but his great-grandfather, uh, Robert Perry, who was actually sponsored by National Geographic and made the cover, I think it was in 1912, um, had a really hard time traveling to the North Pole because there was so much ice and so much snow that they could barely make headway. For us, it was actually quite the opposite because it's melting so fast that it's really, really hard to, you know, to move around safely. And I got a lot of questions today about, you know, how do you deal with the cold and, you know, where do you sleep? And I wanted to share this picture. This is our team, and this is our gear tent. And so, number one, we're all fighting for a very limited number of outlets, you know, because <laughs> you only have one generator. But, you know, we're sitting on the ice, and that's how we slept as well, on tents on the ice. And so they gave us a kerosene heater, and it was great until you realize that everything around the heater is melting. <laughs> so it's actually pretty, pretty, you know, it was difficult going. As a Mexican, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Being in the cold and the ice is not my favorite thing, but I love it. And so I try not to complain. Um, one afternoon, these gentlemen started fishing. You know, they just started pulling little lines in the ice, and they started pulling out these fish. And then they took out their iPhone and they started taking pictures of it. And I thought, you know, that's really weird. <laughs> you know, why would they be photographing them? So they explained to me that they'd never seen these fish before. So upon closer examination, these turn out to be European cod. This is a fish that's so common that all of us have probably eaten it at some point. It's served in a lot of restaurants. But the distribution range of this animal is a thousand miles further to the south from where we were. And so it's another indication that as things are getting warmer, animals are moving further north. And how many people here have ever seen a Greenlandic shark? <laughs> when the hunting... Oh, you're a scientist, you don't count, Bill. <laughs> When the hunting doesn't go well, and, and you know, this is one of the great things about hunting in the Arctic. It is the hunting, it is the dogs that keep these people connected to the sea ice. In other places, like in Canada, where they've traded their dogs for skidoos, they have no more reason to go hunting. You know, here they have to, because otherwise the animals don't eat. So when there's nothing else to eat, this is what they do. They lower um, a line, probably half a mile, <laughs> and they pull out something like this. <laughs> Out of the water, it's just one of the weirdest animals I've ever seen. Isn't it cool? It li lives in complete darkness underneath the Arctic ice. I just thought it's the most amazing animal. When they open it up, it's actually poisonous, you know, so people cannot eat this meat. They feed it to the dogs, and the dogs become kind of like drunken and disoriented, <laughs> but they don't die. <laughs> Um, this is uh, my Notchuk, yes. <laughs> it's his name, and as he's looking into this blizzard, I want us to be reminded that the fate of these people is tied to the sea ice in the Arctic, but so is the fate of all of us, and what we do or fail to do in the next few years is going to determine what this planet is going to look like for the next few thousands of years. I want to introduce you here to uh, my partner, because none of the work that I do today happens alone. Um, Paul Nicklin, he's a Canadian photographer. He works for National Geographic. I should actually say he's one of the most celebrated photographers that work with National Geographic. He grew up in the Arctic. He does polar 
biology, and, and Paul and I are both marine biologists, both very passionate about the ocean, so he's somebody that's really good to play with. And earlier this year, um, that was actually last year, in the dead of winter, we traveled to Norway, to the fjords, where these incredibly large pods of orcas, I mean, we're talking 400, 600 animals, come to feed on the herring. And it's an incredible thing to see, but until recently, it was very difficult to photograph because the sun comes out 12 minutes a day. So you see it like a little sliver, you know, <laughs> comes out and then whoop, it dips back in and it gets pitch black. And so think about this, you know, you're getting in the water, pitch black with a bunch of orcas. <laughs> And so it's very exciting, but the really interesting thing is the orcas have always been there, and scientists have been studying them for a long time. But in the last five or ten years, humpbacks started coming in too. And the scientists from their zodiacs thought that the humpbacks and the orcas were actually collaborating. But no. <laughs> Once Paul and I went in the water with our cameras, we realized that the orcas were really hard. They work and they put this bait ball together and they bring it around, you know, and then one of them will come and eat a fish. And then, out of the blue, you feel them before you see them. These humpbacks, you know, you just look into the depths and you see the pecs, the white pectoral fins, you know, coming in and they don't have echolocation, so they cannot see that we're there. <laughs> so if you don't get out of the way, you know, you could get steamrolled by one of these big animals. Well, they just come in and they steal the whole bait bull. And the orcas are left just kind of standing around thinking, what happened? So I want to show you just two minutes of this footage because this is just a testament to what the new sensors and cameras can do. It's shooting almost in pitch black. And I want you to think about this. Underwater photography has only been around for 70 years. So think about the wonders that we can start recording and documenting with the new technology. I'm doing that, man. So very excited to go back uh, this next winter with even better sensors, better technology. When I started my career as a photographer, because I love nature and I love animals, I thought I wanted to be a wildlife photographer. And whenever there's an opportunity, I take pictures of animals. But I've come to realize that oftentimes animals don't <laughs> want to be photographed. <laughs> They're actually quite dangerous. <laughs> so, even though I love making pictures of animals, my thing really is people photography. You know, that's where I found my niche in exploring that very narrow fringe where humans come in contact with nature, and especially indigenous people. And this is um, a quote that I read early on when I was really young, and it really stuck with me because it's true. The biggest danger to our planet is assuming that somebody else is doing something 
to protect it. And I realized early on that nobody else is, you know. It really is our personal responsibility to do everything we can, everything that's in our power, in our circle of influence, to do something to protect it. So now that I live in Canada, I came up with this acronym, and I've been practicing my Canadian <laughs> accent. So it stands for someone else is likely fixing it, eh? <laughs> Doesn't sound quite believable yet. But but it's just, you know, to think that it's in ourselves the power to do something for our planet. And so I want to share a little bit of, of what I do. And let's go back to people now that I've put the responsibility of saving the planet squarely on your shoulders. <laughs> I feel like I should give you a few ideas for how we go about it. And, and these are things that I've learned from spending time with people that live in very remote areas and that have been living in a very sustainable way for thousands of years. Uh, people ask me about this picture. She's um, a woman from a Lisu minority in uh, the northwestern mountains of Yunnan in the border with Tibet. And the goose was a pet. He was going for a walk. He was not going to the pot, <laughs> although that would make a better story. Um, but the greatest part of my job, the greatest joy that I get from being a photographer is actually spending time with people that still remember the old ways. These are people that are still carving a living with their own bare hands that's full of meaning and full of poetry, like this elder Kayapo woman from the Amazon. And so over th my career, which you know, has been 25, almost 30 years, <laughs> I've had the opportunity to visit over 100 countries. You know, growing up in Mexico as a little girl, I never dreamed that I would vis visit every continent. And I've had the opportunity of working with amazing conservation organizations big organizations like Conservation International, National Geographic Society, but mostly little ones. And um, I try to make images that remind us that even though all of humanity, all of our planet survives because of a healthy nature, for indigenous people it's really a more present and intimate thing because you know, they live by a different set of principles than we do. And before I go any further, I would like to um, give a shout out to my sponsor, to Sony. So I've been working with them since 2008. And um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm a rabid environmentalist, <laughs> but I have pretty strong opinions. And they've given me not just enormous amount of support, they allow me to use their brand and their huge corporate platform to share these ideas with a much bigger audience that I could reach on my own. And there's another perk, you know, I get to use a lot of their equipment too. And so they like to send me cameras and I get to test them in the field and they like to hear back on whether or not, you know, they're, they're sturdy and they work well. And, you know, I can tell you that their cameras are very good, but they're not waterproof. <laughs> so every once in a while, I like putting together a box full of gear and send it back to Mark Weir <laughs> somewhere in this, in this auditorium with a little note that says, it works great, just needs cleaning. <laughs> So, the first thing that I'd like to share with you um, uh, comes from the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And just a little bit of history, the people that live in the highlands of New Guinea were not discovered until the Second World War. There's about five million people living up in the highlands. And they live a very primitive life. And because they live in such concentrations in a small area, this very rugged terrain, I mean, they really don't get along with each other. And so with limited resources that they have to share and you know, trying to prevent fighting with each other, they had to come up with a whole set of rules that they abide by. It's called sacred ecology. So whenever a person goes into the forest, there has to be a whole conversation that happens, you know, whether they're going in for hunting or gathering water or medicinal plants. You know, there's a different set of spirits and gods for the particular activity that you're doing and for the particular part of the forest that you're going. And so that really creates a whole set of filters, you know, on how you behave in these environments. This superstition, of course, translates to, you know, moments when it's really, really ex exaggerated. For example, the Asaro mud men from the highlands believe that if they dress themselves with the mud of the Asaro river, then the bad spirits are not going to be able to see them. <laughs> it's pretty cute. Um, but <laughs> for me, spending time with people that still live in a, in a traditional, comforting routine where every productive activity, whether it's hunting or gathering food or fishing or traditional rituals and dances, 
it still resonates with meaning and with respect for the land. It's really refreshing. And people ask me if I gave these children the gum. And the answer is no. You know, Western influence uh, permeates to almost every indigenous society on Earth. Another example comes from the highlands of Peru, the Andes. This young woman is a Quechua Indian, descendants of the mighty Inca. And the Inca lived, of course, in the entire Andean region, in Peru, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia. And to this day, they worship something called the Pachamama. You might have heard about it. She's an omnipresent spirit. And they believe that if you take care of the Pachamama, she will take care of you. And so they raise their children to believe that the Earth is alive and responsive to our every need. Can you believe how different our planet would be if we raised our children with this belief? Or the Betsy Maraca people of eastern Madagascar, they too live by one of these ancient principles, and this one that until about 200 years ago, every person on this planet shared. And that is the idea that you only take what you need and you use everything you take. And it was you know, in this, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that we figured out how to mine nature, you know, how to exploit it, like if it was an endless resource, that that principle went out of balance. And perhaps one of the most profound ideas that I've learned from indigenous people is something that, you know, even today it's practiced in many indigenous communities here in North America and certainly in places like the Amazon, where every decision that is going to have an impact on the entire community has to be thought out 150 years, seven generations into the future, what impact that decision is going to have. And I just want you to think, as we're going into this election, if our leaders <laughs> were thinking about the children of the children of the children of their grandchildren instead of just the next election, you know, our prospects would be very, very different. And the Maya people were a culture that understood this well. About a thousand years ago, the Mayan empire collapsed. And they collapsed because they had a, a drought that lasted a hundred years. You know, in British Columbia, we've been in a drought for the last six months, <laughs> and I'm ready for it to rain. Um, but the, the, you know, the leading, the powerful caste, the priests and the nobles, they built a whole superstition around access to water because they had to control and they build these incredible pyramids. So Paul and I did a story for National Geographic on, on this area, and of course this is one of the seven wonders of the world, so we had to go through this whole permit process to go to the Mexican Institute of Archaeology, and they made me fill out all these papers, and they said, yep, come back in six months. <laughs> so I went and I gave the night guard 50 pesos. <laughs> and, and pretty soon I had him running up the stairs with his flashlight <laughs> to light that little room up there. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey, you have to do what you have to do. But to this day, the Maya people, the modern Maya, still descend into these caves, into these cenotes, to worship um, the god Shibalba. And Shibalba is the god of the death, and he's a very powerful god, and so you want to be in his good graces. So this cenote is, um, there's many cenotes. I mean, there's no above-ground rivers in the Yucatan. All the water runs under, underground. Every once in a while, you know, a cave will open on the surface and then you can see the water below. And some of them are hundreds of feet deep and some of them are really shallow. This one in particular is only about 30 feet deep. And if you were to swim to the bottom, you would find about 180 human skulls and skeletons there that have been there for a thousand years. That's me, uh, this, this picture is uh, by Paul, and that's me just, you know, to provide for context. But the funny thing is, the Mayan people that own this piece of land, they bring tourists from Cancun, and then they charge them 10 pesos, you know, and people go down that ladder, and they go down the cave, and it's dark, and the water is cold, and, you know, they shriek because there's bats, and then they pull them out of the water, and they go to the next, you know, tourist destination. They never know, they're never told that they're actually swimming <laughs> in a, you know, massive Mayan grave. It was pretty, pretty funny. Across the other end of the planet, in eastern Madagascar, um, people are experiencing this kind of drought today. This woman is uh, from southern Madagascar. She's from a tribe known as the Antandroi. They call themselves the people of the thorn. And they're a pretty hardy bunch. They've been surviving in a very, very harsh environment for the last 2,000 years. What she's wearing on her face is um, pulverized bark mixed in with water, and it keeps the bugs away, but it's also great sunblock. Um, the last five years, these people have been experiencing such a severe drought that it's making it actually very difficult for them to survive. So that's something else to think about. 
Perf perhaps the most profound idea that I've learned from indigenous people, um, I learned from this gentleman. We did an assignment in Hawaii a couple of years ago. The gentleman in the back, his name is Keoni Nunez, he's wearing um, an orca tooth around his neck. And he's a master of this ancient art of tattooing, it's called cacao. It's a little tool and they dip it in ink and, you know, and then they tap the person's body. And Keoni told me that when he wanted to learn this in the 1970s, nobody in Hawaii remembered how to do it because they've been under 100 years of colonization. So he actually had to travel to New Zealand and learn it from the Maori, and then he brought it back to Hawaii, and now he's teaching people how to do it. And the interesting thing about cacao is that you don't get to choose the design. You know, he's the master, so he'll talk to you, and then he'll decide, you know, what's appropriate, you know, what kind of design. And the gentleman on the right, you can see he's been tattooed in the face. <laughs> and I, I can't imagine sitting down <laughs> on that mat and then not having a say on, on what's going to be done. But Keoni said to me, you know, when I start tapping on somebody's skin, and I go tap, 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 I hear the voices of my ancestors speaking to me from a thousand years ago, and that fills me with a sense of happiness. And then he said something really profound. He said, you know, I grew up in a small village by the ocean in a tiny little hut with my family, speaking my language and surrounded by my friends, surfing in some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. I always thought I had everything. But when surfers from California started coming to Hawaii, they said, oh my God, you're so poor. <laughs> he said, you know, it had never occurred to me that I was poor until somebody told me. And that's where the idea of enoughness came from for me. For people that are so poor that they barely have anything, it's often surprising how happy and content they can be. So I got into thinking about it and, you know, listening to the Green Pope a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> about how we are indoctrinated into this marketing thing, you know, this consumerism thing where, where we're told that we deserve to be happy and that happiness is going to be attained if we buy the newest thing. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, the, the next big thing, you know, bigger house, a new car, if you have a baby, you know, stuff, stuff, stuff. And the truth of the matter is, you know, we have to learn to go back to a, a place where we learn to live with enough and be happy with it. So enoughness really matters because at the end of this talk, one or more of you are going to ask me, so what can I do in my personal life to make the planet a better place? And just like we practice yoga and we practice financial discipline, I think we all need to practice a little bit of enoughness. You know, it's something that's a personal discipline. I've actually become a lot more relaxed now when I confront a purchase and I ask myself if this is going to make me happy or not, you know? And I'm actually quite happy to walk away from a lot of stuff. And that's what our planet needs. So interestingly, regardless of where you go on this planet, across cultures, across languages, it is that sense of connection to each other, to our traditions, to our language, to our religion, to our spirituality, to nature and to each other, that fills us up with that sense of fulfillment. You know? And that's the kind of enoughness that no money can buy. I want you to look at this picture and think about the great indigenous leaders of North America 200 years ago. People like Geronimo and Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, they're all gone. But in the Amazon, the chiefs are still in power. And I call it the Avatar Syndrome, you know, just like so many indigenous communities around the world, they're doing battle with industrial powers and political powers beyond their control and trying to maintain their traditional lifestyle. These are the chiefs of, um, of a people known as the Kayapo people. They live in the, in the eastern part of the Amazon. And they own, in tenure, a, la a piece of land the size of the state of New York. It's an enormous chunk of land. So when you fly above it, you see that the entire area around where they live has been logged completely because of deforestation and soybean plantations and cattle ranching, illegal mining. But these guys are maintaining the piece that they own and they patrol it and they're pretty tough. Well, just in the last, well, 20 years we've been battling this, but in the last five years, when the new president of Brazil came in, the first thing she did was approve the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world. Belo Monte is going to sit at the headwaters of the Xingu River, one of the most beautiful, mightiest rivers in the Amazon, and they're going to dam it. And when you look at this river, you know, this is not like the fast-running rivers where you can really create hydroelectric power. This river runs only in the rainy season, and it meanders lazily through the landscape. 
So at the peak of its capacity, it's going to operate only at 40%. And in order to create enough power and energy, they're actually going to create these enormous containment reservoirs. Some of them, the size of metropolitan Toronto, I mean, these are enormous pieces of the forest that are going to be flooded. And that's not the worst of it. Below the dam, the river will dry up. And so there's about 40,000 indigenous people that live in the area that's going to be affected. There's no roads. The only way to get in and out is by small boat. And so when the river dries out, these people are going to be isolated and they're going to have to move into cities and towns. The worst part of the whole thing is, you know, if this electricity was going to a really great cost. And yes, it's going to some Brazilian homes. But these dams are being built to power Chinese mining companies. So there's just like a perverse <laughs> thing about them that's really maddening. So waterfalls like this one will no longer flow. And it's ironic because the river provides everything that these people need. The fish, the water, that spiritual connection to the land. So a few years ago, I mean, this is one of those places where I've had an opportunity to travel back many, many times. Several conservation groups asked me to go down and photograph and put a face to this river. Because the worst part of this is that this is the first of 60 dams that are planned for the Amazon. So I wanted to make sure that people know that this is not just a plot of trees in the middle of nowhere. This is the homes of families, and there's mothers and children that live there. And they're very naive. They, they know that the dam is coming, but they really don't understand what's about to happen to them because they are very proud and independent and self-reliant today, they're going to have to move to the cities where they're going to become beggars, uneducated, incapable of you know, living in our modern society. I feel, after so many years of working there, a tremendous responsibility of making sure that their plight and their struggle doesn't go unknown, and that we are all aware that this is happening. So as these people lose their tradition and they are sentenced to a lifetime of poverty, you know, I just want to make sure that we all know that their life, their amazing traditions don't go without us raising an eyebrow. So what am I going to do about all this? <laughs> you know, enough about this talk about you saving the planet. Um, because I love the ocean, and the more we know about the ocean, the more we understand that it's the most important ecosystem on our planet. Actually, if an extraterrestrial ship arrived on our planet today, they would say, oh yeah, this is an ocean planet. You know, these are ocean people, because there's so much of it. It's 50% of the entire habitat on this planet. Um, so as a marine biologist, as a photographer, I wanted to put forth my skills, my talent, my passion, my influence to try to do something for the ocean. So Paul and I created Sea Legacy. It's a nonprofit organization, and the idea is we're going to identify groups that are doing campaigns and valuable work in the areas that we care about, and then we're going to empower them with our photographs. So I want to play you just a couple of minute uh, video that talks a little about, about Sea Legacy. Perfect. The ocean is like a kaleidoscope. It's always moving with color and gesture and light. And it's never the same twice. It's always different. It has the highest biodensity of life on Earth, way more than any terrestrial habitat. There is an entire new, dark, complicated world. And this world is the engine of our planet. Our own existence depends on a healthy ocean. Every other breath that a human being takes comes from the sea. Without the ocean, our planet wouldn't survive. It wouldn't function. It wouldn't run. When I began, I just wanted to make pretty pictures, you know, beautiful images. But um, along the way, there was somewhat of an evolution. I began to see a lot of problems occurring in the world's oceans, things that may not have been evident to most people. For most people, the experience of the ocean is from the beach, where it looks beautiful and it looks perfect. But there's a thin blue line that separates what we perceive and what we see from what the reality is. Once you go below this very thin molecular curtain of the surface, everything changes. You see a very different story. In the last 50 or 60 years, we've lost 90% of the big fish in the ocean, the, the sharks, the tuna, the billfish. For every swordfish pulled out of the North Atlantic, 10 to 12 blue sharks come with it. 
day after day, week after week, year after year. We've lost half the coral reefs in this planet. You know, think about that. Half the coral reefs are gone. We have lost most of the ice in the Arctic. We've lost most of the ice shelves in Antarctica. And when you see all this life and how it is connected to ice, you realize that we will lose all levels of this ecosystem. As a photojournalist, I sort of felt a sense of, of responsibility and a sense of urgency to begin turning my lens towards those things. I wanted it to be more like war photography, to help tell a better story about what was happening in our, in our world's oceans. The biggest threat to our oceans right now is apathy. If we're ever gonna change people's behaviors, if we're ever gonna be able to change people's perceptions, that's only gonna start with an emotional connection. And that's gonna happen through photography. The idea to use photography to rally for conservation is not a new idea. It was born in the 1800s when photographers went out to Yellowstone and brought back images to Washington, D.C., and that gave birth to the first national parks. Photography has that kind of power. Images coming from the ocean are barely, barely 70 years old, and yet it's most of our planet. 15% of the terrestrial portion of the planet has been protected. Less than 2% of the ocean has the same level of protections. You have to have these replenishment zones. The ocean can heal itself with protection. It has this amazing resilience that it can come back. If we just do that little bit, you know, give it a little protection, it's an investment in everybody's future. All of these pictures have more power than scientists or voices or anything else to open the world's eyes to the sea. Vision is what drives humans. Through the internet, through television, through National Geographic magazine, we truly can <coughs> reach the world to start driving this global debate on the effects we're having on this planet. It's the power of this visual communication that's at the core of Sea Legacy. We want to send photographers out there to the farthest reaches of the oceans where the story is being told. And we want to bring back stories of hope and messages for how this can be done. We still have 50% of the coral reefs. We still have 10% of the sharks left. It's not good, but it's not over. If I could do anything, I, I would hope that the work that we create will compel people to do something about this. We have a small window of opportunity to act, and the solutions are simple. We know what we need to do. We need to show everybody what's at stake. We need to rally soldiers of support. We just need the visual assets to do it. The hope is that our images, that the storytelling can help ignite. To convince the unconvinced. It's the first step in the process of change. Susan Sontag um, once said that war tears us apart and war scorches society. And she said that unless there were photographers there to document the ravages of war, nobody really would care about what's happening in the front lines. Well, it's no different for the environment. And so it's really important as, you know, budgets and opportunities for photographers diminish because advertising is diminishing that we start relying on philanthropy to do some of the work that we need to do. And so through Sea Legacy, we're hoping to re reach people who believe in what we're doing that are gonna support this type of storytelling. Um, so I just wanna close by saying that in the last couple of weeks, the United Nations met in New York and they passed a new series of sustainability goals. You know, this is the blueprint for how we go forward, forward in a more sustainable way on this planet. And they include everything, you know, from educating old children to women's rights to, you know, reproductive rights. But goal number 14 is dedicated fully and completely to, you know, maintaining the ecological integrity of the ocean. And so that's a real opportunity for us. And that really matters because three billion people on this planet, that's almost half of the population of this planet, rely on coastal and marine resources for their daily survival. So that's where marine protected areas are really important. This photograph was uh, taken in Abrolios, and marine protected areas are just you know, like national parks, but they're in the ocean. And the ones that are really good have no extractive industries in it, no fishing, no oil exploration. But they allow artisanal fishermen like this young man to go and catch fish for his family, and that's actually a very sustainable thing. 
So whether we're talking about climate change, like this cute, is he cute? <laughs> we'll talk about these guys another day. Um, but I hope that as we go forward looking for a, a lighter footprint and a more sustainable way to live on this planet, you as creative people, as photographers, as journalists, will join me so that maybe together in a very compassionate and emotional and artistic way can make a difference for our planet. So thank you so much and uh, we're free to go. It's cocktail time. <laughs> thank you so much for coming.